in Cadence Building 10, if you need to know that. If you're lost, ask me. Uh, we're going to be starting at about 7.10, and by 8.30, we should be um, close to closing. Uh, we urge folks to, to sign up. A lot of events are free, but there are other benefits to membership, and it's, it's actually a great... Um, for what you're paying, you're actually getting quite a bit because it's not just the periodicals or the newsletters, but also it's also a chance to network, to connect, and they have online portals that are actually different from everything else out there and useful. Um, and if you're a student, it's really cheap. If you're a working professional, you know, a few more coffees or less coffees will, will make the difference between um, a membership. Um, on November 15th, we've got um, uh, Professor uh, Subhashish Mitra from Stanford, and he's, he's going to be talking about nano devices uh, into nano systems. And uh, the N3 XT, the next, it's a, um, a sub project within, within the school, and he'll be talking about that. Um, really interesting individual. Come, come check it out. On December 6th, we we're talking about containers. Uh, I know that's a new buzzword for the day, but he explains and, uh, and helps us understand exactly what it means uh, behind the buzzword. And Vipin Jain is, is the lead developer at Contiv, so you can also check out his work prior to um, lis listening to his talk. Uh, these are, including me, the folks that you know, make this thing run. Uh, we have Aaron Lauer, who's our secretary, uh, Prakash Ramchandran, who's our vice chair, and this person who's helping us with the AV and running up is Trevor Mayrovitz. Um, please, give him a round of applause. <laughs> um, go ahead and turn off your cell phones, and even on the vibrate, you know those vibrates are not really vibrate. They're still buzzy enough that, that we know something's going on, so please turn it off or, or make sure that it, it is completely silent. Um, we're always looking for volunteers, and especially we're looking for officers for next year you know the election is hot right now, why not be a part of it and, and join the right party, the IEEE party, and, and you can be chair, vice chair, treasurer, or secretary, and all the roles are interesting, lots of benefits, networking, professional development, and you get to be around wonderful people, and it's not only pizza that you get to eat. Um, we're not always. <laughs> no, we're not, but you can absolutely run for a position. We can... We can um, you know, absolutely adjust, and, and it's an election, so run. <laughs> All right, thanks. Wonderful. And now I get a uh, chance to introduce our uh, our speaker tonight, and I'm going to take just a minute because uh, I hope that uh, that you'll see that this is actually kind of a little special to me. Um, I found Alicia through her podcast, uh, Embedded.fm. It used to be called Embedded, but then some NPR got a little NPR people got a little uh, frisky, and they uh, decided that was a really good name too. But Embedded.fm is is where I found her, and I need to tell you a little bit about where I was when I found the podcast. Um, after doing IT for about 10 years, uh, I went back to school, got my engineering degree. And, uh, and worked in my first engineering job for almost exactly two years. And then, without warning, they came through and laid off 10% of the people in the entire company across the board, myself included. And they told us, uh, they told us about a month later that uh, the board revealed that, oh, yeah, by the way, we sold the company. That's why we let you all go. So I was out on my butt. I uh, had desperately searching for a job, and there really wasn't a whole lot to be found in Reno, Nevada, where I'm from. So, in addition to looking for a job, I was looking around for places to learn more about embedded engineering, which is really what I wanted to do. Uh, I was already listening to podcasts and other things like that, so I said, well, let me see if there's some other, other things out there that are, happen to be in, in the field of engineering. And that's where I came across embedded.fm. So, uh, that, was, that was back, actually, several years ago. Uh, she already had over 50 episodes out there, though, but uh, that was still when she didn't let Chris talk that much. <laughs> and I was hooked. It was fantastic. They were funny and engaging, and they were talking about stuff that I was interested in. And even if it was, you know, like, I, I just I was totally engaged. 
Um, if you're taking notes, episodes 51 with Jen Castillo, 153 with Patrick Ewan of Planet are my, in my top personal top five. Uh, also, any of the episodes with Jack Yancel or Micah Scott are, are also favorites. So I said to myself, I said, this gal does exactly what I want to do. She works on awesome stuff. She knows the things that I want to know. She's doing it. I need a job. So maybe she can help. So I emailed the show. Um, you know, basic, hey, I love the show. I, you know, I've been out of work for several months at this point. I'm looking for a job. I want to do what you do. Can you give me any pointers, tips, things? It was a terrible email. Uh, it was lame. It was, it was uh, pathetic. It was, you know, uh, pleading and terrible. It was, it was just horrible. Um, she didn't have to respond, uh, but she did. She didn't just say, hey, thanks for listening. Keep looking, you know, good luck, you know, off you go. She wrote several pages of tips, ideas, thoughts, and things that she had, uh, uh, things that she thought that might be useful to me. She didn't have to send any of that stuff. She was already a rock star in the community. She'd al she was already huge in the embedded systems world. She'd already written the actual book, Making Embedded Systems. And she wrote the book. But she took the time to spell out some basic things, stuff that, uh, stuff that I hadn't thought about. And she took the time to kind of lay that out for this knucklehead from Nevada. So now, fast forward, I did find a job and, uh, and moved to the Bay Area. And now Chris and Elle both are people that I uh, am privileged to call friends. And so it's with that that I now get to introduce our speaker and guest this evening, Alicia White. Aaron, it's just far too kind. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you to the IEEE Computer Society for inviting me to speak. Also, thank you to Cadence for giving us this nice uh, location as well as this lovely video system. As Aaron mentioned, I wrote Making Embedded Systems, and I have this podcast where we talk to artists and engineers and educators about what they do and how they build what they build and how they learn so that we keep up to date in the field. And in my day job, I'm an embedded software consultant. I've worked on consumer devices for LeapFrog and Fitbit, worked on FDA and FAA devices. I've built my fair share of corporate science projects, but mostly I like to ship products that make the world a better place. In my career, I've seen a lot of systems, some good, a few great, and it makes me sad when people leave hardware, leave the joy of touching the hardware just because there are a few oddities in this world. Many oddities, really. And that's what we're here to talk about. As I hope to avoid preparing for my presentation, as one does, I asked my co-host, business partner, and husband to come up with a list, uh, with an outline. And here's what he came up with. I think he was kidding, but there is some truth here. Number five, a electrical engineer. I thought that was just a typo. But it's, it's really true. Electrical engineers, they aren't that tricky. It's a little tricky. On the other hand, embedded systems is an interdisciplinary field. We do have to be eclectic, understanding hardware and software, even mechanical, manufacturing, certification, algorithms. So yeah, when you think about it, eclectical engineering. I happily, this isn't actually my outline. <laughs> and before we dig in, I do want to make sure we're on the same page and define embedded systems. I'm a little afraid that if it's new to any of you, the rest of the talk is going to be incomprehensible. But free food. I am going to talk a little fast. Raise your hand if you can't hear me or I'm going too fast. 
raise it and maybe wave it around if you want a clarification. I'm not planning on taking questions, but I also don't want to leave you baffled because I failed to say all the words in the sentence. Now, the definition. Embedded systems are purpose-built for their application. That's all. But it implies a lot of things. It means they're resource-constrained. The devices have to have a minimum number of features needed to do their job. They still need to be mission critical or cheap or easy to use or low power. So yeah, all of those th things are embedded systems. But one question that comes up is, is a cell phone an embedded system? And from my perspective, no. This is a general purpose multifunction device. It's not very application specific. But for the poor person who has to write the driver so that when I turn it up, the motion system kicks in and turns on my screen, that person probably thinks they're working on an embedded system. Opinions differ. I think we need a specific example. No, the other way. There you go. Let's start with the idea of a simple consumer product, an internet-enabled light. So many projects boil down to an internet-enabled light. But maybe our app our IoT light is a holiday light. You can leave up all year long and it changes automatically for the, the day of the year. You'll never forget Valentine's Day if your house starts turning pink on fe February 1st. Or maybe it's like this light where Aaron and Chris and I ran around the park waving it wildly with different patterns in order to get this painting picture thing. Or maybe it's a door light that comes on when you get home because your phone's in range. I want to make fun of the IoT light concept because Internet of Things just deserves to be made fun of. But there are some applications, some interesting, useful, real applications. And that last idea can only be done with BLE. So let's make it an Internet of Things BLE light and go on. To get funding for this idea, we'll need a proof of concept. We have many possible platforms, many possible uh, processors, and the Qualcomm lines are cheap, but nearly impossible if you want to write your own code. And the TI CC2640 is an awesome processor, probably one of my favorites, but its dev kit is big, and at $300, not really a good proof of concept. Nordic line is popular and offers many examples. It's easy to get a lovely small board from Oshchip or BLE Nano or all these people. So we go to Adafruit or SparkFun and we type in BLE. I know it sounds like that's sort of odd because those are maker or hobbyist sites, but there's some advantage to that. Their stuff is debugged, it's documented, and it's tested, and that will make our proof of concept go faster. And really, it's better than throwing darts at a dartboard to choose your processor, which is what many people end up doing. So let's go with the OSH chip because I know the guy who made it and it's little and small and pretty to look at and it uses the Nordic 82, Nordic 51 822. I have a good feeling about it because I saw it in other similar products, which is a big key that it's widely used. As for the LED part, we want smart LEDs, ones that can change colors. And that just means WS2812 right now. They're very popular, and there's a new version out, so these are getting even cheaper. We put all this together, pulling down sample code as needed, and we find out that the LED sample code is written in assembly. Nobody really wants that. We toss it. We say, this doesn't work. The reason it's written in assembly is because the Nordic runs an RTOS, and the RTOS won't let you deal with the WS2812 tweaky timing requirements. Everybody out there says, oh, it works, it works, but then as you try it, it glitches, and you realize that the other half of the internet that's saying, use an AT tiny in between, they're right. So we go ahead and we do that. We solve this strange timing bug, and now we have a proof of concept. Anybody else hear the ominous music coming? I've been throwing around all of these numbers and letters, and it's not important for you to catch them. It really isn't. I'm going to continue, but this definitely is one of those things that it isn't one of the tricky parts in my book, but this whole figuring out the letters and the numbers, getting used to the acronyms, 
no one is born knowing all of them. And once you know them, you tend to fling them around with abandon. The jargon is exclusionary, but it's such a necessary shorthand. When I post this talk on the Embedded FM blog, I'll post the text, and that will include links, I promise. For now, as I wave my hands furiously, don't worry about exactly which Nordic chip I'm talking about. And through the magic of hand-waving, our proof of concept mostly works. It wasn't trivial, but it wasn't hard. With all of that example code, we didn't have to do that much. We had to figure out a serial driver so we could talk to the LED controller, and we had to come up with a clever control method to make the LEDs do what we want. When we checked with your EE, these processors go into low power modes. If we do end up having to use batteries, it won't be a problem. Proof of concept works. It came together so easily. Sure, we can ship in eight weeks. Why not? Well, that's the thing. Everything from this point gets harder. It's much harder. And it's worse knowing that you can do all of the features you want to do. All of your intended functionality works. So now you're just fiddling. And it doesn't feel right. But our proof of concept missed a bunch of things that make it so we can't continue unless we address them. Now, there is many pieces of embedded specific information, education you need. Things like, what's all this stuff in the data sheet? And what's a register? Why do PWMs require two timers? When do you use interrupts and how are they called? What's a race condition? What do you do about priority inversion? And how exactly does one twiddle bits? To learn those sort of definitional things, there are resources out there for you. Uh, Computer Society is giving away one of my books. Of course, this is a resource I'd recommend. I like it a lot. I hope you do, too. But there are blogs, there are YouTubes, there are classes. The definitional stuff you can find if you look. So what are the truly tricky parts? I think debugging, downloading firmware, dealing with resource constraints, other people's code, and innately hard problems. So let's start with debugging. Embedded systems are difficult to debug because they aren't desktop systems. If you don't design it up front to be debuggable, you may not be able to ship it. Firmware iterations take much longer than software, and hardware iterations take even longer still, by a lot. With our IoT proof of concept, we had all these boards wired together so we could look at each component and make sure each component worked on its own. Once you have a custom board with everything integrated, you can't see the signals anymore unless you plan ahead. And unless you plan ahead, you may not be able to change the code at all. Almost all embedded systems are cross-compiled. That means that they have a compiler on your computer that compiles it to machine code it can't run. And then it uses a programmer to download to your actual device, your board. And that programmer, it could just write the code to your board, or it could be able to step through the code, or it could even be able to trace and profile. But it's not a modern IDE. It's not what you expect if you've been writing software. You may only have a few breakpoints built into your processor. Not all of these watch variables and breakpoints I get to use when I'm running modern code. And we do have an R test on the Nordic, which is good in many ways, except you can only use one breakpoint or you mess up its timing and it crashes. I am actually, I should say, I am going to make fun of Nordic. I like Nordic. I like their chips. The problems I'm talking about are industry-wide. It's not just Nordic, and yet that whole breakpoint thing just annoys me. Anyway, our proof of concept was probably uh, generated using embed or a free compiler, maybe the Kyle compiler, um, but it's it's size-limited version. The reason we would use a Kyle compiler is because that's what Nordic uses. That's what their SDK is built with. Nordic's Getting Started Guide, their tutorials, it's all with Kyle. And 
embed has some of those things, and the development platform, the OSH chip that I chose, has a getting started with embed guide. But embed's online, and many people don't want to rely on an online tool. Once you see Kyle's per seat license, well, then you start wondering if GCC is the way to go. People talk about it works. And I certainly hate paying for tools for compilers of dubious quality. I had a better desktop compiler in 1998. But unless you have a large team and a lot of resources to throw at the problem, you don't want to spend all your time trying to figure out why your compiler doesn't work. Is it some combination of linker file and processor configuration, pixie dust? Overall, buy the best tools you can afford. As true for hardware and software, your time is precious, and debugging is not really a good use of it. Of course, you could do test-driven development, but that has its own set of problems. The code deployment cycle from editing to actually running takes several minutes, which isn't that bad in some other deployments, but you're just trying to fix the GPIO to go one way instead of the other. You have to start planning. Are you going to type it problems? Or are you going to think about problems? And one of the challenges is when a problem is hardware, you're going to need more tools for that, different tools. So instead of spending money on the compilers, you start looking at the oscilloscopes and the logic analyzers. Your voltmeter can tell you if things are connected together and if a chip is even powered on. The oscilloscope can tell you a lot more than that. But you have to know how to use it. Their interfaces are not necessarily intuitive especially the software engineers who have a plan on how it should work. And the electrical engineer comes and twists the dial, and you're like, that's not right at all. I should have pushed the auto button. The auto button should work, and it never does. <laughs> a logic analyzer is also useful. It's a lot like a, an oscilloscope, but more digital signals. It lets you snoop between uh, communication protocols. You can look at SPI. You can look at UARTs and serials. But Again, you have to pick up the manual or watch YouTube or whatever you need to do to learn in order to get a good grasp of these tools before you can apply them to your problem. And sometimes you have to figure out, you have to realize that you are not going to solve this problem by typing at it. You have to spend the hours associated with setting up the right tool in the right way. And it's a pain because there's fiddly little clippers and maybe you need wires and all of that. But not everything can be solved simply. Not everything can be solved without looking at the signal. It's sort of, sort of like it's a science, but cooking is like chemistry. And yet you still end up with a lot of difference in the practitioners of cooking. Of course, you have to make sure the signals are available on your custom board. What you want to remember for that is during the schematic review, these fr this phrase will come in very handy. Where are my debug test points? Just keep saying that over and over again. It'll occasionally cause your ED to really get frustrated, but then you ask them about ground loops, and then they go off, and it's fine. You will need to learn how to read a schematic. But again, I think that's tedious, not tricky. It's a shorthand. You can get that from a book or from a blog. And I want to take this time to note your bare board is not the same as your computer. Not only is it sitting there naked and unprotected, where coffee is sure to let out the magic smoke, it may be rare. Your first few prototypes cost a fortune because you sampled the parts that was free, but there are only 10 of them. And if you mess this board up, you may not be able to get another one. It's going to make developing the firmware very difficult. Depending on the design, there are ways to destroy your board through software. It's kind of tough to do that to your laptop. But flash locking, enabling the power at the wrong time, draining the battery too low, or bad bootloaders can all turn this board, this precious, rare board, into a brick. So let's check in with our IoT light. Here you can see the connection between the compilers on the top and the programmers and the chips that we chose. The UART with its two lines goes between the Nordic and the Atmel, and we can use that to sniff the interprocessor communication, figure out what they're saying to each other and how that's different from what we intended. 
but we still can't see anything that's happening inside the Nordic. We can look at the spy, we can look at the UART, we can look at the LED string, but the Nordic's a black box. If BLE is working, we might be able to put logging information over to the phone. If we had a UART, I would say send that to the computer so you could write yourself messages. But the Nordic doesn't have that. It doesn't have a good way to debug at all. We're going to pull some GPIO lines out in hopes we can use those for test points and debugging. But this is a big risk to the project because if something goes wrong, you can't fix it. And that's why debugging is really tricky. So my list of tricky things, because you have to plan ahead. You have to think about it weeks, months before you start typing the code. Now, I said about the GPIO lines. You're going to pull them out. You may be able to write Morse code to yourself if it comes to that. Because that's how many embedded systems are debugged, using a logic analyzer and looking at those lines to figure out where you are in the system. Another way to debug is to make thorough tests that can run on the Nordic before the RTOC starts. And then you can use your breakpoints. You can walk through those tests. You can verify your hardware before BLE ever starts. And with the AT Tiny, I didn't have any way to walk through the code. But it has another UART. I can write printf. I can debug that. The goal is to make sure you have the facility to enable later debugging. When you are desperate, you can use it. That's starting to look a little like a schematic. You can see how it keeps getting more and more complicated. Not exactly, but the system's gotten a lot more complex. I added the debug GPIOs up there, and I added a hardware revision over there as well, so we know what revision of the board we're working on. There's this whole subsystem where I added batteries. Because if we're going battery, we're going to have to be able to monitor it. And speaking of power, we might have gotten away with driving the LED at 3.3 volts for our proof of concept, but it's a 5 volt part, so I put a MOSFET in there as a level shifter. And now the spy lines go to the Nordic as well as out for the debug. That's going to be important for firmware download which was my second list, second item on my list of tricky things. We put in pins on our custom board to connect so we can do the programming. And then we can use those in manufacturing to put the code in. But what are we going to do when it gets out of manufacturing? How are we going to get our code from our server, well, from my desk where I've done a new release, to a server all the way down to our boards in the field, to our customers? It's another thing you have to think about, you have to prepare for. There's some thought, well, we'll just have it update over USB. That's what our devices do until you find out just how prohibitively expensive that is, especially when you've already got BLE on board. N Nordic has their download firmware update example code, which definitely we should use, but what about the AT Tiny? How is it supposed to work in real life on the real board? There's so many painful points around firmware downloads, and I wanted to make the whole talk about that. But that seems wrong because so many processors, including the Nordic, do this semi-automatically. And the Nordic even does it in a relatively safe and secure way, and it still ranks up there as tricky. There are, are many options for how to download firmware. That first one is an onboard bootloader. This runs before the code ever does. And if certain conditions are met, it goes into bootloading mode and it flashes its code. If conditions aren't met, then it goes and it runs its code. That's great. If power is lost midway through, at least our bootloader is still functional. Our code may not be, but at least we can recover. And that's how the AT Tiny works. Now, if you're updating the bootloader, when power went off or connection disconnected or whatever catastrophic event happened, then you're hosed. You've created a brick, and you can just throw this board away. Hopefully, you'll never need to update your bootloader in the field. At least that's the theory. The second option up there is titled to build your own bootloader. Say your code includes the ability to load new code. 
the new code gets put into scratch space before it gets loaded into runtime space. And so you, you load all the code into your scratch space, and you verify it, you decrypt it, and then verify it, and then you copy it over. Works pretty well. But you have to have that scratch space, which up here is noted as RAM, but it could be flash, it could be whatever. The big problem there is now you have to have a huge space available for your new code. That's what the Nordic does, and it means that we end up being able to use less than half of our promised flash because we're too busy using it to download firmware. And that last version up there is when you don't have the luxury of space. You can load your loader code into RAM and then you run from it, and if you have the scratch, which now can be smaller, you load the code that way. But if you don't have scratch space, you just load the code directly into your processor, which is a very, very good way to create more bricks. Have you heard this stupid interview question involving a goat, a cabbage, and a wolf? And you have to go back and forth across a river in order to get everybody. That is what bootloaders are. That just represents exactly all of the pain and suffering of a bootloader. Trying to move memory from one place to another and to keep the system locked, safe from being bricked. The Nordic firmware doesn't care about the ATtiny image, and we sneak it in there by calling it part of the image. But that means that our scratch space has to be big enough for both. And so you can see up there, we have the ATtiny image, and the scratch space is the ATtiny image plus the runtime image. Suddenly, our 256K of flash just got carved up so that we're only running 32K of code. And I do have a 32K log in there as well. So when we made the proof of concept, we didn't have to think about any of this. It just worked. And now it's crucial to our ability to fix bugs in the field. And given the schedules these days, it might be crucial to our ability to get the promised features into the field. But it's treated as an afterthought, a very expensive afterthought. It'd be better to fix the code before it left our desk. It'd be better to fix the code before it left the factory. We don't want to fix the code in the customer's hands. And yet, we have to make it possible. I want to mention security. I mention security with bootloaders because your company probably wants you to think about security in terms of their code. To make it so that nobody else can read their code. I hope you think about that, but also you have a responsibility to your users to keep their data private and to keep your device from being destructive to their other devices. There is no universal answer with security. There's no secret to make it simple. It is a moving target. It keeps getting harder and harder. I have a device security checklist post that you can look at and say, Am I doing all the right things? But I can't tell you how to implement it on your system. Only are you doing it. Nordic does an okay job with downloading. It does an okay job with BLE security. Unfortunately, BLE security is crap. It's just terrible. I can't say that enough. It's really, really, really bad. There are some lovely videos on how to hack your own phone. Hackers can inject their firmware into your stream. It's not hard, except that they can capture your bits, and then they can capture your device, and they can use these the way they want. How does that change what you do? Note that decapping a chip to really read out your latest bits, still a little expensive, but not hard. If somebody really wants it, they can have it. Does that change what you do? Physically, if a hacker physically has your device, they can figure out all your test points, all your debugging methods. They can figure out what you are, what you are doing with your system, and they can make their own vision, version if they care enough. All this is about setting a threat model early on and figuring out what you need to do about it. Ask the question and get the answers. Overall, you do the best you can with security, and if you make an item with high profit, well, the possibilities are likely that somebody is going to want to come and eat your lunch. Big lunch, they won't share. 
one heart bit piece of advice for regarding security. Don't roll your own security bits. Use standards, talk to experts, get your system audited. If it's important, you have to do these things. Security is complicated and you will make mistakes in the way you implement it, in ways you will never test for. I actually think security is gonna be an even bigger topic going forward. The increasing number of legal actions, both civil suits and regulatory, it's gonna get expensive fast to do security wrong. When you start out with your proof of concepts, you don't care about the way things are implemented. It's usually the most straightforward way. Your UARTs are polling, not interrupt driven, and they don't use the FIFO, let alone the complicated DMA scheme that can make it really fast. The vendor examples are written to verify their chip and your hardware. Their goal is to maximize processor sales, not to minimize your RAM usage. With firmware downloads, we saw how we can fill up that 256K just so fast it goes by in a blink. We start out with these plentiful, plentiful features, and then they just get chipped away with every feature as you go along to a complete production run. Part of our definition of embedded systems implied that it would be resource constrained, and now we're going to pay for that with our code. The goal is to pay as little as possible and to optimize wisely. So let's look at what our software needs to accomplish when it's just running normally, not downloading firmware. The items in blue were there with the proof of concept based on the sample code we got from the vendor. We had to rewrite the UART drivers to be more tailored to our application, and the debug subsystem is wholly new, newly built. Interprocessor communication had a lot of feature creep as we talked to marketing. Now there's the whole pattern generation on the Anki Tiny to support fancy LEDs. Let's say you're doing all that. You're running what you need to run and the systems start getting strange. Maybe Nordic's RTOS crashes every third day or when the moon is full or whenever you send a debug message to the AT Tiny. And it is really annoying when it's your debug messages that cause your system to crash because you take them out, but it's only a symptom of a much larger problem that you are gonna have to deal with and now without debug messages. The key is to figure out what's taking an unreasonably long amount of time and focus your attention on that. The code on the top is a great way to measure how long a function takes. It lets you know which things are taking the unreasonable amount of time. It does require you have a function, requires you to have a function like get tick count that will measure the amount of time between things. And it does sort of imply you can output that information, maybe through debug output, something we're lacking in the Nordics. But there's another way, the GPIO test points. And those that we've requested from the EE will finally come in really useful. We set them when we go into a function, we set them when we go into a function, and we clear them when we come out of a function. We can see the connections between the system, the order of the function calls, and how they're patterned. We can do this for interrupts to see who's taking too long. And you can use that get tick count method in this top form where you're measuring each piece to see how long each thing takes. Or you can do the second one where you have to do multiple because maybe your timer doesn't have enough granularity or your function's just too short to measure. Whichever one of those you do, you do have to make sure that you're measuring, you're profiling what you care about and not the profiler itself. And the easy way to do that is to comment out the function of interest and run the profiler on its own, make sure it says zero. Okay, but the last one here is different. The idea is you have a timer interrupt. And you look at what, where you came from when, you interrupt, when the interrupt happened. You look at the, the return register so that you can find out what function was being called when you interrupted it. This is profiling through statistical sampling. And it's great because you get an overview of the whole system, where your uh, functions are spending time. 
course, it doesn't measure anything with the interrupts off. And you do need a log to figure out where to put all of this stuff, because it's going to be a lot. And you want to make sure your timer is maybe a little random, so that you aren't in lockstep with some other function that's happening. And you're going to need some post-processing to merge that list of addresses you got into function names, probably in Python using a map file. Which reminds me, map files. Do you know about map files? I know this talk is all about the tricky parts of embedded systems, and I keep saying things like challenging and problematic and complexity. Map files are anti-tricky. They make embedded systems easier. It's a file that the linker generates. It stores where all of the functions are in memory. It usually lists them both alphabetically and by order. And that order is kind of important for when things run over. It also sums up how much flash you are using and how much static RAM you're using. You can see where things are going, where the heaps and stacks are placed in memory. So then you can do some more monitoring there. I thought about going through a map file, but I couldn't make it big enough. So I'm going to encourage you to go through a map file, to go look in your executable directory, your list directory, and to open it up with a function and look for a function. Look and see how you can see how big the function is and where it's located. You can see whether or not it has any static RAM and where it put that static RAM. You may get information about where the function is called from. Just take a look at the map files, ideally before you desperately need them. Like profiling the processor cycles, knowing where your resources are going is critical to being able to optimize wisely. And as long as I'm handing out suggestions, when you're optimizing, I strongly recommend you use a scorecard. You're going to find that some things depend on other things, and you have to do them in order or you have to figure out where the dependencies are. So, scorecard. Another suggestion, and this one sounds kind of terrible, and I only bring it up because it's really, really important. I don't care if you use C or C++ or Go or Rust or Python or whatever. Whatever it is, learn the language. Learn what happens from when you type it in all the way down to where it runs on the process. Is it being interpreted? Because that's very different. Is it being run? Can you look at the assembly? Can you make any connection? Can you find a list file that will take you from what you typed to what it's running? And C, I admit, is my preferred language. Maybe C++. I go back and forth. Both of them have foibles, and people use these foibles. Pointers are important, especially when you don't have enough RAM or you're doing interesting things with the processor, like DMA. And processor registers are a lot like pointers. Pointers are really important. If you're going to use C, learn that part of it. As long as you're learning bitwise arithmetic with those old truth tables we saw in college, suddenly become a lot more important when you have to do, bit, when you have to do shifts and masks to set and clear bits. And you want to know which one you're doing in the register, whether it's setting or clearing, because it's really important. And volatile is a C keyword you need when your variable is being used in an interrupt. And some people let bytes overflow because their circular buffers are 256, and, and that makes it so much simpler for them. Anyway, people use the outer edges of their languages on embedded systems sometimes because it's fun and optimization is amusing, but more likely because they sort of have to. You don't have enough resources to do everything you want. And that makes the code difficult to read, which means it's easier to rewrite than to read the existing code, which means that you're not going to reuse that code, which means you're going, to you're going to introduce new bugs always. Never-ending stream of new bugs. Your defense against this is to learn the language. And then the next step is to start reading assembly and the processor registers and figure out what's actually happening. Once you have the language down, now we're going to have to start thinking about the idioms inside the language. In C, malloc and free are usually avoided. 
because they make the RAM less predictable and they can fragment it and make it so it doesn't work. And so we tend to use arrays, but that complicates the code. It isn't wrong to use malloc in an embedded system. I really thought somebody was going to scream on that line. It isn't wrong entirely to use malloc in an embedded system. It's just really uncomplicated. It's really uncommon. These idioms, like don't use malloc, become so ingrained that you sort of forget to tell them to each other. OK, a heap is where your malloc's memory comes from. And a stack is where your in-function variables come from. Also, some things regarding your function itself comes from the stack. If you overrun either one, you go outside their allotted boundaries, no one will tell you. No flashing lights, no instant error. You might be able to set it up so you get a hard fault, but maybe not. Instead, what happens is your system just starts being weird sometimes, random. So what you need to do so look at these chunks of RAM and maybe fill them with known data, FFs or AAs or dead beeps or dead codes, whatever you use, and then look to see how much you've used after a certain period of time has gone by. Will your system be able to survive for 60 days below your high water mark? Or will you always increase your amount of RAM usage? Tips like these, and there are a lot of them, they accumulate and they're handy, here's how I usually fix that sort of wisdom. They really only come from having practice, from having the problem and either invented a solution or found the inventor of a solution and then implemented it. It's just experience. It's not magic. It's not even tricky. Near the beginning of our IoT project, I shoved in an ATtiny as an LED controller. Even though there was an example code available for controlling our LEDs from the Nordic. See, the WS2812 LEDs are controlled over a single wire. And you string them together so a whole string is controlled through one wire. And the commands have to be sent just the right way. They're built up by holding the voltage high or low for a certain amount of time. Where that time is between 0.35 microseconds and 0.6 microseconds. But there are different amounts of times you have to hold it for. And those times you have to hold it for are, are plus or minus 150 nanoseconds. It's, this isn't a matter of running out of processor cycles. It's a matter about of the precision of the timing that you can get. And I've, I mentioned RTOS, which stands for a real-time operating system, which doesn't mean you get a lot of precision. It just means that it responds deterministically. And the Nordic RTOS has a latency around milliseconds. That's not going to help our microseconds with nanoseconds. No, that's not going to work at all. These timing mismatches are very tough. That's an area where an oscilloscope and a data sheet are crucial. And sometimes you have to look at the assembly to figure out what's really happening. It may be possible to control these LEDs through SPI, and I, I don't want to go into that too much. Um, but we have other options if we know about them. Once the ATtiny is in there and working, it's going to be really hard to rip out, even for cost and complexity reasons. Speaking of things I sort of snuck in, added battery features and low power monitoring because it's such a common resource constraint. And I'm not sure exactly what our IoT Lite application is going to be. But if we need batteries, we're going to need them to last longer. Optimizing for low power requires you to understand sleep state. Sorry. So that slide cracks me up. Uh, the goal is to do whatever processing you need to do, and then immediately go to sleep. As with many optimization problems, the first step is to figure out what it is you intend to do. The second step is to measure to figure out if you actually did it. When our lights are on, we are probably drawing lots of current. Optimizing our processor to go from 10 milliamps to 9.9 .9 milliamps, if LEDs are drawing an amp, who cares? That's not what you should be spending your time on. Most processors have different levels of sleep. A light sleep with the CPU off, but just about everything else on, drawing microamps, maybe low milliamps. A deeper sleep with the peripherals off, 
and yet the ram's still on so you can run from where you were and know what you were doing before. That's from the micro ant. And then there's hibernation, which is very low, and you can't run from where you were. You restart, but you're still part of the system and you still can wake up, usually through an external impetus, like a, a button press or a GPIO line going up and down. That's in the nano ant village. All of these have costs, not only in terms of power, but in terms of time. To be able to go in and out of these states is not free. So you have to plan where you're going to sleep, when, for how long, and can you bundle your tasks so you do them all in a row. How much time will you spend in each of these modes? You need to know where your bottleneck really is, and it may not be when your processor is running. You may need to set the GPIOs to their lowest possible power state when you go to sleep. That may be what's using all your batteries. Of course, you can't optimize what you can't measure. You have to measure power, and low power things are difficult to measure. The lower the consumption, the more difficult. Your $30 voltmeter probably works fine when you're drawing milliamps, maybe even microamps. But if you're down in the low microamps and, and nanoamps, now you have to deal with this thing called burden voltage, which means that your measurements are going to be bad, and your electrical engineer needs to come over here and set up a proper tool, or you need to rent a proper tool. All these little ramifications going around about these tools, and the details all are important at some point. Optimize doesn't mean make things small. It means make things right. Okay, moving on from resource constraints, probably the trickiest of all things about embedded systems are all the things you don't get to control, all the things that aren't your code. Of course there is the hardware. There's this great cosmic battle between the software engineers and the hardware engineers, and the embedded people are in the middle, hopefully, on both teams, not on one or the other. And we want to mitigate the risks associated with hardware by making good board tests that anyone on the team can run. And we want to read the errata and the data sheets so they don't bite us later. But that's a skill you have to practice. Your software is really only as stable as your hardware that it runs on. And you and your hardware person are a team. And if you aren't, that's a big red flag on your whole system. Your board tests very likely will become manufacturing tests. Because as you go from a proof of concept to production, you have to be able to build these boards in quantity. And firmware is where you support that. So you plan ahead a little bit with your board tests, knowing they're going to grow, they're going to go on and do other things. You may need to deal with environmental and certification needs, because there's nobody else on your team who knows how the board works as well as you do. In your proof of concept, we got to make a mobile app that just was a debug mobile app, one that probably came from Light Blue or, or Nordic itself. But now we're going to have our own, our company's mobile app, one that we didn't write, and yet we have to interface to it in a way that works for both of us. And if it has to download firmware, it has to get it from some cloud server and has to securely go all the way through. You may not be able to control other people's code, and the tricky part of that is just accepting it. And I, I mentioned we started our system from the sample code. This is another version of code that you don't get to control and you're going to get pretty angry about. Demo code and reference designs are there to give us a foothold, but they don't know how we're going to use it. They don't predict all of the cases and applications. If something comes up, there's a bug in the Nordic's download system or some tweaky BLE feature that we are the first people to use in their soft device. They give us new code. They fix their bug. Yay! Except their new code is not backward compatible with their old code, and all of their interfaces have changed. This happens across the industry, often. It's so frustrating. But I suppose all the software engineers know about this. I mean, Python 3.0, looking at you. Just playing with that. Uh, the last area of tricky things are the application-specific things. You're building something. Sure, right now we're talking about an Internet of Things light. 
adding a few features can move it from trivial to wondrous. And I don't have time to go into all of the possible details these can, can come up, these, all these deserve. But calendar time is one of those awful tricky things. Time zone differences, you know, some people vote every year whether or not they're going to have daylight savings time. How are you going to put that in your firmware? And leap years and coordinating with the clock on BLE, you're going to have to have another process, you're going to have to have another chip to do this. You're going to need a real-time clock to make this all work because your Nordic has clock drift and it won't be able to keep up with real time, not our time, it has its own. So we just have to think about how we're going to do this in the future. And with our IoT light, we may avoid internationalization, which is great. We don't have a screen or an LCD or a keypad, but if we did, we'd have to talk about storing the characters for Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese. It's going to tax our resource-constrained system. It may affect what LCDs we can choose because the, the granularity is very different for different languages. And I have a whole presentation on that, so I'm not going to go into it, but localization is sort of one of those tricky, fascinating, if you love it, you entirely love it, and if you hate it, you entirely hate it sort of features. And I love algorithms. That's probably what I love most. I love signal processing and machine learning and control theory. And I think security is scary but cool. But algorithms can make the processing in RAM grow exponentially. There are a lot of ways to cut corners on the mathy bits. And many of those are fascinating in their own right. But not really part of the talk tonight. So let's return to this list and make sure we covered all of these points. No, let's not do that. My points were my tricky things, debugging, downloading code, constrained resources, other people's code, and innately hard problems, though I do agree with liturgy memorization. Those five things, those are the tricky parts about embedded systems, and it is because they are purpose-built, resource-constrained systems. That's really the definition. You have to optimize for particular resources, whether they're power minimization for battery systems or tweaking processor cycles so you can respond fast enough or limiting RAM and flash so that your part can cost less. For all of these, you have to spend the time thinking about these tricky parts up front, planning, testing, debugging, considering how to deploy and how to secure it, generally thinking about how the end customer is going to use your product and what that means for the whole thing, from the very beginning, how to get from here to there. The design is important. Real objects cost real money, and they take real time. You can't work an extra day to make a board and firmware system work if the hardware is broken. You can't work an extra hour to make a physical object be something else. At least, you can't scale that. You can change the components, but that takes time and money to do all on all of the boards because you are throwing away protons. If your salary, your time is a fixed cost. Having you change the electrons through software, after your salary, that's, that's free to your company. Protons, on the other hand, cost real money. So when you have to deal with them and you have to work with the hardware, that's where things get really interesting, really tricky. The bugs you fix early on are the cheapest bugs to fix. The longer the problems go on, the more we become accustomed to them, eventually believing them to be features. But no customer sees them that way. So maybe that's the really tricky part. All right. I am not planning on taking questions. Uh, the probability that I can solve why your board only works during a full moon here is pretty small. I'd rather give it a thorough consideration and ask you instead to contact me uh, here if you have questions. I'm happy to answer you privately or on the blog or on error. Um, if there's clarification on that, go ahead, raise your hand. Otherwise, come up. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
but the question was, can I recall the most difficult debug problem I have encountered? Um, and I can think of September. No. Um, so firmware download. Uh, this is sort of a debug problem. Definitely one of the most expensive failures I've ever made. When I worked at ShotSpotter, we made gunshot location systems. You sprinkle se uh, sensors around a city and automatically call the police. Well, the sensors are sprinkled around a the city. They're not, they're not near you. Should something go wrong during firmware downloads, which we really tried to avoid, you had to visit the sensors. The sensors that are located in bad parts of town. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> and it wasn't anything that I could have figured out on my desk because it had to do with this particular network configuration. You had to be on site. And once we figured it out, you had to be on site on every building that had a sensor. So I, I guess I probably should have chosen something more along the lines of I squared C versus spy and oscilloscopes and logic analyzers. But you know, really, it, the most difficult debug situation I was in was either that or the time I was upside down in a NASCAR, in the NASCAR pit desperately trying to make my magnetometer work, which it was never going to do because metal. Um, and the race was going to start in 45 minutes, and those guys really wanted me to get the hell out of their car. Yeah, that was, I mean, difficult debugging often for me involves anything over 110 Fahrenheit. <laughs> the time I melted my hiking boots in the desert. Uh, yeah, um, trust me, I would be happy to do that for the next hour. Okay, if you want an embedded FM sticker, so you remember to listen to the show or you just want one because you're kind of pretty, uh, please come up and get one uh, right after Aaron gives it away. The, the book. book. Indeed. Let's give a big hand to Alicia. Thank you. Now, okay, we're going to get there. You guys will get that in a moment. But we have actually a certificate. Uh, and a gift. Oh, come on. You could have given me that first. Thank okay. you. Now, you have to set that down. I do? Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't have given it to you. Yeah, I should have. It's all right. I need at least one hand free. Yeah. Okay, I've chosen one. Does anybody want to bribe me now? Now is a good time to bribe me. Oh, by the way, did I mention that she signed it for you? Ooh, how about that? All right. You guys got your tickets? Oh, they have tickets. They have tickets. They got oh, the yeah. other oh, side, see? You guys okay. got your tickets? I didn't know how this was going to work. Yeah. No, that's all right. They got tickets when they when they signed in in, in the front. Uh, I think uh, 740, everybody's there. 5701. Hey, all right. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Very good. Excellent. Well, guys, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And uh, uh, remember, we have a talk coming up on uh, November 15th, as well as another one on December 6th. So uh, be sure to check the website. Also, I'll be sending you guys an email about, about those shortly. So thank you again, Alicia, for coming out and thank spending you. some time with us. And uh, thank you guys all for coming out. If there's pizza, take it. You know. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next month. <laughs>